Is here. We uh, think about Good Friday, and we said in our Good Friday service a couple of nights ago that on Friday it seemed that hope had died. If you were looking at Good Friday from the perspective of a bystander, a first century disciple of Jesus, or follower in that first century world, and you came to that hill called Golgotha, and you watched, it, you watched that man, Jesus, die on the cross. You saw all of the events surrounding the crucifixion. You left that day pretty hopeless. You thought that hope had died, hope that you were putting in this man named Jesus, whom you had seen minister. You, you heard him teach many great things. You saw him raise the dead and heal the sick. And yet it seems that the powers that be have just won out. They've taken his life and ended his life between two criminals on a cruel Roman cross. And I want to suggest to you this morning that for all of us, that is a reality at some point in our life where we think just like those first century witnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus, that hope has died. Maybe you're there today. You know, if we're honest, as we think back over the last year or so, we've been in some pretty hopeless situations. 
We've been in situations that maybe we've never found ourselves in before. And on top of that, maybe you experience great changes in life. Maybe physical changes, maybe financial changes, maybe job changes. Loss of someone special in your life. And those times in our life, much like those first century believers thought as they stood at the foot of Jesus' cross, are hopeless times. But do you know what the wonderful message of Easter really means? It means that hope indeed has not died. We say that Friday is a reality, but Sunday is coming. And I want you to understand today what that means. If the resurrection is real, that means no matter where we are in life, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching or listening by some other means, and we're sitting here in hopeless situations, I want to tell you this morning that nobody is hopeless. No situation in life is hopeless. How can I tell you that? I can tell you that because the grave is empty. That's what the resurrection means, that we have hope today. And this morning, I want to share with you from Mark 16 and the first 13 verses of Mark's resurrection account. I want to share with you about the hope of Easter this morning. The hope of Easter. And when I say that word hope, I don't use it like I hope it doesn't rain today. It may rain, it may not rain, but I hope it doesn't. When I use that word hope, it is a sure hope. It is the hope the Bible talks about. The hope that we can place our entire life in because we know it is not just a maybe circumstance. It is a reality that is going to come to pass because of what Jesus has already done. You see, if Jesus would have just died on the cross, he would have just been a man who fell at the hands of the Roman Empire like many men fell. But Jesus did not just die on the cross. He came to life three days later, and that's why we celebrate Easter. And because Jesus came to life, that means no matter what situation we find ourselves in this very hour, and I'm not trying to downplay your situations at all, Because many of us are hurting, we came here with a lot of burdens, a lot of difficulties, and perhaps we do not know where to turn. But I want to share with you this morning that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is hope. Look with me, beginning in verse 1 of Mark chapter 16. We're going to look at the first four verses to begin with. And Mark says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James And Salome brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. And when the sun had risen, they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. What is the hope of Easter? Well, first of all, I I want you to understand the power of hope. I said just a moment ago that this is not hope like we hope for things that might happen or might not happen. But this hope that we talk about is biblical hope. It is hope that the Bible repeats over and over and over again. It is hope that Paul devotes a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 to because as he was ministering to the Corinthian church, there were many who were saying the resurrection is not real. And Paul, being just... A, a couple decades, if that, removed from the resurrection of Jesus, writes to them and, and tells them, indeed, the resurrection is real. If the resurrection is not real, then we who say we believe in it, we who are gathered in church on this Sunday morning that the calendar has labeled Easter Sunday, if the resurrection is not real, Paul says, we are to be pitied above all people on the planet. Because we are basing our actions, we're basing our worship in something that we don't believe is real. But Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians 15 and he says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you that the resurrection is indeed real. And because the resurrection is real, we have power over death. That's why we can come today and talk about the hope of Easter. So what is the power of hope? 
In these first four verses of Mark 16, Mark tells us as uh, these women have been gathered and they were there at the crucifixion of Jesus and they were uh, there on the Sabbath on Saturday when no one could get out and about, no one could move around the town. Uh, There were only certain things you could do on the Sabbath as a Jewish person and so they were honoring the Sabbath day to keep it holy just as God commanded. But when sunrise came on Sunday morning, the Sabbath was over and so they could get back to life as normal. And Mark says that these women, and this is going to be very important if you do not believe the reality of the resurrection. And I will get to that in just a moment, but let me just go ahead and say, if you're here today or you're listening today and you're skeptical about this thing that uh, we call the resurrection, that this man died on a cross and somehow he came back to life, which no one has ever done before, and, and yet we're placing our, all of our faith as a, as, a, as a religion. We're placing all of our faith and trust on this one act, the power of the resurrection. And you say, well, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. I don't know if I believe that. We have to go no further than Mark 1 to really prove that the resurrection is real. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, if you're skeptical about that, you're not the first skeptic that has come along. There were skeptics in Jesus' lifetime, post-resurrection. And Mark knew there would be skeptics. And if you knew people were going to be skeptical about the resurrection, in the first century world, no offense, ladies, I'm talking in the first century world, there is no way that as an author of a letter of a gospel like Mark that you would have said these first women were the first to the tomb. Why? Because no one would put faith and trust in a, the eyewitness of a woman in that day and age. You just did not do it. And so the fact that all the gospel accounts tell us that the first people to the tomb were women, and they, were, they gladly told us that because it was true, because it was real, shows us the resurrection is real. We don't have to go any further than that. There's no way the Bible would have recorded that women were the first to the tomb to see the tomb empty if there was any trying to overcome, overcompensate, trying to prove something that did not really happen. And so we have to go no further than Mark 1, but Mark tells us Mary Magdalene, and let alone a woman's testimony in that day and age, Period. The first person Mark mentions is Mary Magdalene. (laughs) She did not have a very good reputation among people. And yet Mark gladly says she is one of the first to the tomb. And Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. What we see here is a a beautiful picture, a beautiful uh, uh, symbol of, of the power of hope that it's going to reveal to us. These women have been in mourning since Friday afternoon. They've been in their homes on Saturday, and they cannot wait until sunrise. Many of you are thankful that we didn't have sunrise services this morning, that we didn't have to get out and get dressed and, and, and be outside early this morning. Well, these first women, they could not wait for the sun to get up so that they could get out their door and gather their spices and travel back to the Garden of Gethsemane to be where they placed Jesus just a few hours before on Friday afternoon. And they come, Mark says, lest we uh, forget, very, uh, ver- uh, verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, Sunday, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. The resurrection is why the, cha- the Sabbath changed from uh, Saturday to Sunday. Another proof of the resurrection of Jesus. The history of the church would not have changed uh, the meeting day of Christianity if the resurrection were not real. There had to be a legit reason to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And from the very first Uh, uh, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, we find the church meeting on Sunday instead of Saturday. Power in the resurrection. But they come on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying, "I I love this. As they're journeying along, they say, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? And then Mark says in verse 4 that the stone was very large. So it's not, we have a 
a cardboard cutout up here of uh, a first century tomb and a stone, which is not like a, a graveside that we have in our day. People in, in the first century world, especially around Jerusalem, were buried in, in uh, hillsides and in caves, more like it, because stone is everywhere in, in Jerusalem and, and in Israel. And so uh, they would be gathered there. Uh, you would find structures on the hillside, and uh, oftentimes you would walk in uh, to a, a, a tomb and you would find burial places for many different people. There's a, if you ever go to Israel, you can go in, in the, you can, when you go to the Garden of Gethsemane, they have a, uh, a tomb set aside for a tourist uh, spot, a tourist location, and, and the stone is rolled away. I have a, a picture that I, I love uh, to remind myself of very often of when I went there to the Garden of Gethsemane, and you walk up to this tomb, and there's a sign outside the door that says, For he is not here, he is risen. And the stone is rolled away, and you can walk in that first century tomb. It's really a tomb. And you can see the places cut in the rock where they would place bodies. And these women are journeying to the tomb. And as they're going, they say, we know what it's like to bury people. We've seen these tombs, and, and that stone that is rolled over the door of the tomb is heavy. And we cannot move it. It is very large. And Mark says, verse 4, looking up, when they approached the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. The power of hope. Unexpected hope for these first century women. I want, to, I want you to see that as they journey to the tomb, they're talking about how large the stone is. Now, I don't know if Mark intended this or not, and maybe I'm reading more into Scripture than is there, but I don't think I'm being heretical by stating this. That stone that these women were discussing on their way to the tomb, how are we going to roll it away and enter so we can anoint his body? As I read that, I can't think but help about the power of sin in our life. It's too big. It's too heavy. How in the world are... We're going to roll it away. Whatever are we going to do? Have you found yourself in sin and just trying to do better? Have you found yourself trying to get over things in life? Have you found yourself in those situations that we call hopeless? Whether we're victims of it or whether we partake in it or, or we take it on in our life of some other form, you see that stone in front of the, the door of the tomb is exactly what sin is. Sin is not just the little moral slip-ups that we do and we fail at every day and we're all sinners. We all fail every day. God died for the power of sin that produces those effects in our life. And it is heavy. It is like that stone in front of the tomb that we cannot roll it away. The woman knew, the women knew they could not roll it away. They needed help. And they're saying, who can we find? Who can roll away the stone for us? And what do they find when they get to the tomb? The stone has already been rolled away. Do you understand the power of hope in the resurrection? It does not matter what struggles we have in life. It does not matter what sin may look like in our life. It doesn't matter what our past may look like. It doesn't matter what our present may look like. We may feel like we have it all together or we may feel like we have nothing together. But we all need God. And here's the beautiful reality. Because of the resurrection, God has already rolled away the stone. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to God. You just have to come to God and God does the rest. But you have to be willing to come. He says, let all who, who would hear, let all who would listen come. But you see, hope changes everything and hope is Jesus we're not talking about hope as an emotion or a mystic reality hope is a person hope is Jesus and Jesus died on the cross the Bible says not because he was a sinner not because he was a criminal he died in my place and in your place because we are sinners and God knows that God is he, he's, he's gracious and he's merciful, but God is also just. And 
God's justice will not allow him to let sin go unnoticed. And because we're all sinners, God said, I'm going to take the payment on myself because of my love. The cross, we said Friday, is a place where the love of God and the justice of God meet. He looked to the cross and he was not okay with us living in our sin, but he was not okay with us dying in our sin either. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God knew what sin would cost us in life, and so God paid the price for himself. Jesus died on the cross for our sin, but the power of the hope is that death could not hold him. The power of the resurrection is uh, death could not hold him. Hope changes everything, and hope is Jesus. Can I ask you this morning, where do you need the power of hope in your life? It may seem like a very hopeless situation. You may feel like we're living in a very hopeless world. You may feel like there's no one to turn to. There's nowhere to go. But because when the, the women arrived at the, the tomb, the stone was rolled away, we have a hope that is powerful. If God can defeat the power of sin and death, there is nothing God cannot do. That's what the resurrection tells us. It's what it shows us. But not only do we see the power of hope, we see the presence of hope. Look with me, verse, um, beginning in verse 5 through 8. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. <clears throat> you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Hope is a person. We see the power of hope, but we see the presence of hope. They get there to the tomb, they walk in, because a first century tomb, you can definitely walk in, and you can see burial spots there cut out. And they see a, a man sitting there, and, and he's glowing because he's a messenger from heaven. And he says, he's not here. This is wonderful news. Now, it's frightening news, but it's news they did not expect. And it's wonderful news because they're coming to the tomb from a human perspective, a human mindset, to go pay respect to Jesus. It's the first day that they're able to do this. Their hearts are still hurting from what they witnessed on Friday. And they get there to, to anoint his body, which was very common. And he's not there. The tomb is empty. We know Jesus was the only one in the tomb because the Bible says it was a, a, a tomb that had not been used before. And they get there and there's nothing to do. Because the one they're coming to anoint is gone. You can imagine the astonishment on these ladies' faces if you were going to the graveside of a loved one and you find someone sitting there waiting to tell you you're not going to find their body here. I mean, these ladies, they're, they're in the Bible, but they're not anyone special. They have feelings and doubts just like you and I do. And that's exactly what we see here. Jesus had prepared them, and he told them, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. But they, it did not sink in until much later, as it, would not have really sink, it wouldn't sink in with us either. And so they hear this man telling them, I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. But he says, he's going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will find him. And I love this, just as he told you. Just as he told you. Everything happened according to Jesus, just as it was supposed to happen. Jesus did not die at the hands of political figures because they were more powerful than Jesus. Jesus died a sacrificial death because it was in the plan of God so that I would not have to and you would not have to. That's how much God loves us. But the presence of hope is this uh, messenger from heaven was directing them to Galilee because that's where Jesus already told them he would be. If God tells you something, you can mark it down. It's going to happen. 
If he tells you something, you can mark it down. It's going to happen. You know, sometimes we say, uh, um, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, we can cut out that middle part. <laughs> the Bible says it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. If God says it, it's going to happen. So often in Scripture we find someone being told something, and then they're, they're, they're reminded, just as you were told, just as God spoke to you, just as God said it would happen. Let me tell you something. I make mistakes every day. You make mistakes every day. God has never made one single mistake. God has never made, said one thing wrong. God has never said one thing he had to apologize for. God has never done one thing he had to apologize for. God has never almost made a mistake. God is absolutely perfect. Jesus was absolutely perfect. And a perfect man died on a cruel Roman cross for us imperfect people. And he rose from the dead just as he said he would to give us life today. If that's not reason to rejoice, I don't know what is. I'm not trying to downplay what we're going through in life. Many of us are hurting. 2020 has been a very rough year. We didn't like it at all. I've had a lot of conversations about 2020, but I've not heard one, people, one person say how much they enjoyed it. <laughs> That's been a common. And of all the, of all the uh, things that have been so out of the ordinary, one thing has been a common reality in I've not talked to one person who said they've enjoyed it. Sure, we've had experiences. Maybe you had some good experiences in 2020. I pray you did. Maybe some good things happened, but many of us had some very difficult things happen. The world has been turned upside down in a lot of ways. But you know the one thing that brings us together today? Jesus is still Lord. He's still Lord. My life can be ripped away from me. My health can be totally gone. Those that we love most dear can be gone in an instant. Our reality that we knew it can be taken away from us. But because a perfect man died an imperfect, uh, the death of an imperfect person and he came to life three days later, we have hope today. We don't place our hope in this world. We don't place our hope in the religious system of the world. We don't place our hope in the political system of the world. We don't place our hope in the health system of the world. We don't place our hope in the financial system of the world. We place our hope in a man who has conquered death, and his name is Jesus. I want to tell you something this morning. I told, I told the youth last week was that just last week <laughs> um it's okay to not be okay you see some of us we come to church on sunday especially easter sunday we put on the special outfits that we bought and we prepared to wear our easter best and we come together and we often do this week after week and we try to put on our best game face to at least for an hour or two look like we have it together and we come in and tell the children to act right in church and just get through the service so it all can look well. But underneath all of that, we're struggling. And there are many struggles, many hardships. It's okay to not be okay. And a lot of times as religious people, we need to put off the facade all the time. We need to put off the facade and realize religion is what crucified Jesus. Can we just remind ourselves of that this morning? Religion is what crucified Jesus. You say, well, Pilate did it. Well, who was, who was during Pilate on? It was those chief priests. Okay, they were the religious people. They were the ones that Jesus had the problem with. It was expected for Pilate to crucify Jesus. He was a pagan of the world. But the blood is on the religious people's hands because they were supposed to know better. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way. You know why? Because we have a Savior who's conquered death. And we take our pain, we take our uh, ways of not being okay, we take our problems, we take our doubts, we take our frustrations, we take our hurt, and we lay it at the foot of the cross because God cares. Matthew 11, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because that tomb is empty today, 
you can have rest today, whatever you're dealing with. You can have rest because the presence of hope is a person, Jesus Christ. We see the power of hope. We see the presence of hope. Lastly, we see the provision of hope. Look with me, beginning in verse 9. He says, Now after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons. You see, you wouldn't have uh, included Mary Magdalene as the first woman to the tomb if you were trying to cover up something that was not real. So um, that speaks for itself. From whom he had cast out seven demons, she went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. See, the, the very first people, they refused to believe Mary Magdalene because who is she? A, a woman's witness was not, a woman's testimony was not regarded in that day. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying it was the culture in which they lived. And so they refused to believe her. Mary, you had demons. <laughs> we're not going to believe you. What are you trying to stir up? <clears throat> Verse 12, And after that he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. So there was a lot of unbelief among the first witnesses to the risen Lord. Maybe we're in this room today and there's still a lot of unbelief. But the provision of hope is this. It's all about life. It's all about life. God is not okay with death. Death is a result of the fall. God did not ordain in the beginning. God created the world. He placed Adam and Eve there to enjoy the goodness, and He gave them a command. And you say, well, why did God even give them a command if He didn't want them to die? Well, God didn't want robots either. And we don't ask all these questions of why God did or didn't do this thing, we, could, we, we all have those questions, but we know God is God in His perfect way. He worked it all out. That's all we have to know. And, and, and Adam and Eve did the very thing God said don't do, and so death entered the world. And God knew that it would require Him, His Son, even before He created Adam and Eve. God knew it would cost Him Jesus Christ. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. God did not just give Jesus at Christmas time. God gave Jesus from the foundation of the world. Before God created Adam and Eve, God had already given Jesus because He knew Adam and Eve would mess it all up. That's how much God loves you. If you ever question whether you're loved by God, just knew God created me even though He knew He was going to have to sacrifice His Son for me. You see, the, the provision of hope is all about life. God wishes that none should perish, but that all should repent and come to life. Jesus said in John 14, um, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He didn't say I am the death because he was going to conquer death. But Jesus said no one can come to the Father but only through me. Stop trying to work for your salvation. Stop seeking false promises for your salvation. Salvation is simple, but it's not cheap. Do you realize that your greatest need today, whatever needs you bring in here, your greatest need is salvation from sin? And this is how it works. If that's your greatest need, either you're going to say, I'm going to pay for that on my own. I don't like to receive help. I'm a do-it-myself kind of person. I want to live life like I want to. So I'll take care of it. I'll pick up the tab. Well, here's the tab. We die in our sin. We die separated from God. Sin is so costly that it cost us an eternity in a place called hell separated from God. That's the tab we have to pay for sin if we're a do it ourselves kind of person. God knows that in His providence and in His sovereignty, and God says, I'm not okay with that. I love you. I created you. I knitted you in the womb, and I formed you for a purpose, and that purpose is to be reunited with me. And so God says, if you will let me cover it, then I'm going to send my dear son to die in your place. And on the cross, he's going to take the guilt and the pain and the punishment of the whole world 
of anybody who ever has lived, who's ever alive in that day in which he died on the cross, and whoever will live, he's going to take all of that on himself. And he's going to die a perfect sacrificial death. And three days later, he's going to come to, be, come to life again. And if you put your faith and trust in that, it's paid for. Which seems like the better option? <laughs> That's what we're faced with. To me, it is, no, it is no question. And we were talking about this after our service Friday night, and Virginia reminded me, she was taught at some point growing up in church that <clears throat> when you think about what Jesus endured on the cross, and we heard Dr. Bob give us a wonderful medical explanation of that Friday night, but it's not... Um, Jesus was dying there in his pain and in his anguish. And Jesus had the guilt of the whole world on his shoulders. Can I ask you something? When's the last time you did something that you felt really guilty about? You knew you did wrong. And you felt so guilty about it. And the guilt will eat you alive until you deal with it. Now think about Jesus. Not just feeling your guilt in that, for that one thing. Feeling your guilt for everything you've ever done. Not just you, but for everybody who will ever live. All of that guilt and anguish was placed on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The perfect man. Not because he deserved it. Not because he was guilty of anything. But because you and I are guilty. When I think about that, I say, how dare could we ever say, how could God send anyone to hell? God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. It's the wrong question. God wishes that none should perish, but all come to repentance. The better question is, how could God save any of us? Because our sin is an offense before Him, and it cost Him literally the weight of the world. But the wonderful truth is, when it was all done, when Jesus said it is finished, the Bible says he lay in the grave. Literally, he descended into hell to defeat the power of sin and death for us. And that's a theological discussion for another day. But three days later, at sunrise, Jesus is an early riser. <laughs> Literally. All throughout his ministry, we see him getting up before everybody else, going to be alone with the Father. And I was thinking this morning before church uh, how that tied into his life and ministry. Even the ladies are up, ready to go. They're looking out the window, waiting for the sun to come up. And as soon as they see the first light of day, they head out. And Jesus is already gone. And on that first day, they get there, and the tomb is empty. Don't miss it today. Don't downplay what that means for you and I when it comes to hope. I ask you, do you believe in the provision of the resurrection? You can say yes, and your answer can save you. you your answer can't save you. God has saved you, but your answer places faith in what God has done. Or you can say no, and that's your choice. But that doesn't change the reality of what God has done for you. And if you're here today and you say no, I pray that you will come to grips with the love of God in your life and the power of what He's done before it's too late because God desires for you to be in His family more than anything else under His glory. You see, you come to the resurrection and you can say it's false. But if you say it's false, you've got to deal with some pretty important um, discrepancies that do not meet your conclusion. I would love to have time to go into those, but we don't. But if you wonder what they are, just see me, and I would love to sit down and share them with you. You can say it's false. You can say it's fiction. It's just made up. And again, you have some things to deal with. Or you can say it's fact. If you say it's a fact, then that literally changes everything. It gives you hope. It gives you a wonderful reality. But it has to change how you live your life because you no longer live your life for yourself. You live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done for you.
to be in Christ. One atheist one time uh, was speaking with a theologian and he said, you know, everything hinges on the resurrection. He said, if Jesus really is risen from the grave, then that means God is real. If it means Jesus has risen from the dead, then that means the God of the Bible is real. And therefore, the Bible is true from cover to cover. And this is an atheist speaking. And he says, if the resurrection is real, it means the Bible is true from cover to cover. It means that Jesus was a real person, and which uh, extra biblical evidence tells us he was a real person. Um, but it means that what he said and did in the Gospels is really real. It means his crucifixion was real, and if the resurrection is real, then that means that Jesus is the deciding factor over heaven and hell. It was an atheist speaking, and he's right on target. Where I take it a step further is not to say if, but because. Because the resurrection is real, all of that that I just said is true, and Jesus is the deciding factor over heaven and hell. Where do you stand today? You're going to leave this place filled with hope because the tomb is empty and Jesus has met your greatest need. And if you did not realize that salvation was your greatest need, I pray that you do now. And if you need salvation today, what a wonderful way to end this corporate gathering on Easter Sunday. I invite you to come. would love to walk you through how to be saved. Heaven, all of heaven will rejoice over your salvation. If you're not with us physically, I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment. And, and I don't want to lead you in a special prayer because I, I think sometimes we have failed at leading people in special prayers because it's not a special prayer that will save you. It's you telling God you're a sinner that will save you. And all you have to do is tell God you're a sinner in need of a Savior and you believe that Jesus is the only Savior to make you right with Him and you want to trust Him, you want to give your life to Him and you want to live life His way and not your way. And He will save you. And then let us know about that because we want to celebrate with you. But if you're here as a child of God this morning and you've just come in here with baggage and a lot of hopeless situations, can we lay that at the cross this morning and leave here filled with hope? That wonderful hymn that we sang a moment ago, Because He Lives, one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites and probably was we gathered in with churches all across America singing it this morning. It's become an anthem. You know, I heard Bill Gaither say not too many years ago that when he wrote that song, no churches would sing it because they thought it was too contemporary. <laughs> it ought to tell us something about contemporary music. But because he lives, Bill, uh, the song says, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives. You see, I don't have to go any further than because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's true for me. And I'm leaving here today filled with hope because that's true. Can you join me? Is it true for you? If not, then you can respond to the Lord, whatever's on your heart and mind, and you can leave here today singing that anthem, not with your, your voice, but with your life. Maybe you need to come forward as salvation. Maybe you need to come lay something down at the altar. Pray for someone who's lost, that this would be the year of salvation. Maybe you just need to come kneel and pray and worship to our risen King and say, thank you, Lord, that the tomb is empty because it changes everything. But would you not fail? Would you, would you not respond to the Lord when He's calling you to do it? See, a failure of a response is still a response. Let's be obedient. However the Lord would lead us to individually worship Him as we celebrate this Easter Sunday. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Can you? Father, thank You so much for the wonderful provision of Jesus. God, Thank you that you saw us as we were. For some of us, you see us as we are right now.
God, you're not okay to leave us that way. And Lord, you've done all the work. If we will just respond in faith. Lord, whatever is holding us back from being fully committed to you, would this Easter Sunday be a day of change? Lord, we know that first Easter Sunday was a day of change, all right. Lord, because you live, everything is different. Thank you today that we do not serve a Savior in a tomb who would be no Savior at all. But Lord, we serve a Savior who's conquered death. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that needs life, that they would grab hold of it, agree with you that they're a Savior, agree with you that you are the Savior, I agree with you that your way is the right way and you can make them eternally right with God. And that salvation would come. Lord, for others of us, we've come together today and we've tried to put on a good face because it's Easter, but there's a lot of hopelessness in our life. And Lord, you are hope. God, would we lay those things down and will we find your rest today? Lord, would you lead us forth from this time together to worship you in spirit and truth. Give you all the glory and honor. Because, Lord, you're risen. You're risen indeed. Because you live, we can face tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Now, would you lead us in this time of response? And we ask it all in your name.